Good morning, and welcome to Mount Olive's fifth virtual worship service. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for being part of this. Um, I want to thank any visitors maybe that are, are watching this because you've, you've seen this on Facebook or somewhere else. I want to uh, thank all of our, our members for sharing this around. And, um, and again, just uh, want to welcome you here to, to this time together that we have. Um, I hope we are all continuing to stay united. Um, obviously, Christ, his spirit is uniting all of us, whether we're in the same place or not. And of course, I hope we're praying for each other and we're praying for this church, that we're praying for, of course, our hospitals and healthcare centers, and uh, we, especially in this time, as we're, we're thinking about turning the corner and, and what's in the future and how we get back to a more normal thing, please continue to pray for our leaders and all of those who are making decisions as, as they're going into this time. Um, of course, stay in contact personally, reaching out to each other through our Sunday School uh, Connection program that we have, uh, through social media, and any other way that you can get together and, and, and really be together with each other in any shape, way, or form. Um, continue, of course, to reach out and, and minister to those around you, whether it is just a call and a kind word, whether it's meeting a need that you see, or of course, please, if there's anything that you think the church can help um, as a body um, from, from our benevolence fund or whatever, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to me or to Scott or to any of the leadership team more and just uh, help. We'll, we want to serve the Lord. And we want to serve you and the people that are, that are around in our community. Um, also, I want to thank those of you who have been able to continue giving, and don't forget there's multiple ways to do that. You can always um, send a, a check through the mail. You can go to our online payment portal that way. Um, but again, just be, be prayerfully considering you know, how you can help and stay faithful in that in this time. And my prayer certainly is that in this time that whether, you know, those of us that are in the sanctuary here, for those of you in your homes, in your living rooms, wherever you're watching this, whenever you're watching this, um, that we can all worship together in this time in spirit and truth. And um, in, in light of that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first uh, song now. It is a, sort of a, a new one, a different one maybe for some of us. It is called Stir Your Church, O God Our Father. So join us now.
Thank you guys for leading us this morning. Our scriptural focus comes from Psalm 101 verses 6 through 7 as we prepare our minds to think about ministering before God. Lord, put on my heart Psalm 101 verses 6 and 7. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. With this on our mind, uh, let us turn towards our uh, prayer time. We have a few things, a few updates that uh, we want to give you. Um, we uh, have removed uh, Mike Beeson from the prayer list. That's Jessica Moore's father. He's doing well. We've also removed Bob Wax, who's Suzanne Jones' father. He's doing well as well, and so we've removed both of those. Um, we've been praying for Yvonne McPherson, and she is home from rehab, um, but is quarantined, uh, I think for safety reason at that point. And one other, remember Joyce Tarrant had fallen and had broken a bone in her neck, and they're still trying to determine whether or not she's going to have to wear a neck brace for the rest of her life. Uh, but she has not had any of her follow-up meetings because of the uh, coronavirus issue. So we're, we're much in prayer uh, for that and for healing for that. We also want to remember, it's very interesting earlier in the week to wake up early in the morning and to see the roads that I was fairly familiar with under, under um, duress from the weather. And, um, and so we know some friends and family members who are stressed from uh, the tornado that came through earlier in the week and we want to be praying and we also want to be have our ears and eyes open how we may minister in all of this. So with that being said, let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father, we do want to pray for our leaders our governor and our president and our local leaders as well as we deal with the issues of the coronavirus. We do pray, God, that the curve would flatten and that this would disappear. However, Lord, give us strength as we are trying our, to um, obey all the social distancing and doing homeschool and, uh, Lord, doing everything from a distance. And we ask you, God, that this would be a short thing that we do. In the meantime, Lord, may we be still and know that you are God, and may we have uh, used the time for your glory. Father, we thank you uh, for those who've been able to remove from the prayer list. We ask you, God, that um, you would continue to be with Yvonne McPherson, and especially, Lord, Joyce Tarrant. We ask you, God, that you would uh, be with her and her family as they are making decisions. Lord, we pray for those who have suffered from the weather, and we ask you, God, uh, that we would be your hands and feet throughout all of this. We ask you, God, that you would bless this church, help us learn how to still be the body of Christ in this place by yet being distant. Uh, give us wisdom as we move forward. Now, Father, for the time ahead, for the service ahead, we ask you, Lord, that your spirit would reign among us. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next song is Let Your Heart Be Broken. And, and you know, I know, don't, don't just sit there on your couch or in your chair. Go ahead and stand up, open your mouth, and let's worship together.
So this song, Trust in You, is a song that's really uh, meant a lot in my life through uh, some of the troubles and trials that I've gone through. So I hope that it's uh, a blessing to you to listen to the songs to trust in God, that he knows everything that's going on in our lives. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I've tried to win this war, I confess My hands are weary, I need your rest Mighty warrior, king of the fight No matter what I face, you're by my when you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow brings There's not a day ahead you have not seen So when all things be my life and breath I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less When you don't move the mountains I'm needing you to move When you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through When you don't give the answers As I cry out to you I will trust, I will trust I will trust in you I will trust in you You are my strength and comfort You are my steady hand you are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher, your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go, you've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust. 
in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Well, Josh, you are just a man of secret talents. Uh, that was awesome. We thank you for that. If you have your Bibles with you today, I want you to turn to our Philippians passage as we're exploring the, the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30 is where we would be today. Remember, as we're looking at the book of Philippians, um, we are... I've titled my series, Get With the Program. Uh, the book of Philippians is not about joy, although joy is a byproduct of what the book is about. The book is about having a Christ-centered gospel, uh, Christ-centered gospel-focused life. And so then if that is, if Christ is our life, then joy is the byproduct of that, but not the point of that. Right? So if we do things to get joy, then we're not really with the program because it's Christ-centered and gospel-focused. And so uh, in this, uh, he will address, and, and by the way, this is all of us together are to have a Christ-centered, gospel-focused life, and that brings the unity of the church is what Paul is concerned about. There are three things that will destroy the unity of the church and Paul will address these in order. He'll talk about selfish ambition, false doctrine, and personal animosity. We are still talking about these personal attitudes uh, in chapter two. And Paul will give us today, he'll give us two men. Uh, he'll give a great recommendation for these two men. A great thumbs up, if you will. As my job and my duties as a professor, I get asked to do recommendations all the time. I get asked to do recommendations for people I'm sure I've never met. Uh, and now that things have gone into online and distance learning, I get students who send me an email, says, I would like a letter of recommendation. I took an online course from you years ago. Show enough. So what do you do with that? Well, there is a temptation to just give a good recommendation anyway, but you don't want to lie. And then there's a temptation. I found a list of ways to give a recommendation that are telling the truth but aren't searing the conscience. Things like this. So if you had a student who was chronically absent, you can say something like, a man like him is hard to find. Or how about, it seemed his career was just taking off. I'll let you think about that for a moment. What, what if the student wasn't very good? You know, D equals P, I'm out of here, you know, sort of thing. For the poor student, you could, you could say something like this, there is nothing you can teach a man like him. <laughs> How about the student with no passion at all, right? He could not care less about the number of hours he put in. Or, or maybe, maybe you, it's pretty rare, but every now and then you get a dishonest student. I know you're shocked about that. But every now and then, a job seminary is one of the things we try to do is weed them out before they get to you. But anyway, what about a dishonest student? Well, you could say something like, his true ability was deceiving. <laughs> or maybe for a lazy student, his work, his work ethic is truly unbelievable. Or maybe an insubordinate student. Uh, he, he responds to authority like no other that I have seen. I guess we could go on. Now, these are temptations to give the people, and I tend to uh, try very hard to give a very honest evaluation. And sometimes I just tell a student, I don't know who you are. 
In our text today, Paul's going to give a recommendation of two men. And they are not like this at all. These are men that he's known, that he's worked with, who are, by the way, examples of a Christ-centered, gospel-focused life. These will be his third and fourth examples. He mentioned his own example in chapter 1, for me to live as Christ and die as gain. He mentioned Jesus as the example, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. And now he gives us two more, Epaphroditus and Timothy. And in our text today, Paul will give us the right attitude about ministry in Philippians 2, 19 through 30. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask you, God, to fill us with your spirit. So we're gathered in a lot of different places, in living rooms. Some of us are listening on, uh, on DVDs. Some of us are in the car, just all over the place. But Father, I pray that we would be at your table in the next few minutes. We ask you, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, Help us to learn of your word, learn what you would have us to do and be, and then empower us to do it. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You've heard Gatorade years ago, and I put it in the worship guide. Gatorade years ago had an ad campaign, Be Like Mike. Paul will actually say something like, Be Like Tim. And so in, in um, Philippians 2, 19 through 24, he will, he will give Timothy as an example. Let's take a look at the text in 2.19. He says, But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn your condition. Timothy is somebody that we're familiar with, for he was with Paul in the book of Acts in several places. Uh, he is the recipient of a couple of letters from Paul as well. And in fact, he was the amanuensis for Paul. And at least on one occasion, he was an emissary sent by Paul to take care of a poor situation in Corinth. And so he has a long association with Paul. No doubt. The Philippians, who, by the way, knew Timothy. Timothy was with Paul when Macedonia was evangelized. No doubt they had hoped to see the young man, somebody that they knew and loved. And Paul says, sorry about that, but I have decided to keep him with me. And he gives several reasons for that, and they're all built around Timothy's characteristics. Take a, take a look. So first of all, first reason he's going to keep him for now was that he was genuinely concerned for the welfare of the saints. Look at verse 20. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. And you think about that. Though. So here is Paul in uh, prison, and he doesn't have anybody around him that's like Timothy. So there are other people we know about in the New Testament. Though We could ask the question, what about Luke? Is Luke not like Timothy? Or what about Titus? Titus is one of my favorites in the New Testament. He's the Mr. T of the New Testament. He'll say, you and whose army on occasion. I uh, kind of like that. What about Epaphroditus who's in this text? Paul says, I have nobody else like him. Now, what he is, is referring to those around him in Rome. So Luke is not with him. Uh, Titus is not with him. And Epaphroditus is with the Philippians by the time they get this letter and so in, in many ways um, the Romans that are around him are pretty sorry lot this is truly sad comment on the spiritual health of those around him especially those claiming being the ministry around him that they don't have the same spirit that Paul does who are genuinely concerned for your welfare they couldn't care less about the Philippian Christians. It doesn't mean they didn't have a kind heart about themselves, about some of the things going on around them. They did not have a global vision in this. Timothy, truly caught on to loving Jesus. It's interesting, isn't it? When you love somebody, 
you ought to be able to love other people who love that same person. Right? So when come, somebody comes to you and says, I adore your child. Your child is so awesome. You know, you, you don't feel like hatred for that person. Right? You, just, you feel a bond toward, toward uh, that person. And in contrary, when somebody comes to you and says, let me tell you what your child did today. And usually that's my wife uh, who will say that. Causes a little friction when that happens. But if you love Jesus and I love Jesus, then we ought to be able to love one another. Amen? And so this is, uh, this is Timothy's heart. And John 21 is a, an example of this. Peter is before Jesus. And uh, Jesus is giving him opportunity to erase that disaster of disowning him three times. And so he asks him three times, do you love me? Remember that? Remember what pa Peter's response was? You know, Lord, that I love you. And then Jesus' response to that was, feed my sheep. Tend to my lamb. If you love Jesus, you will love what He loves, and that is other believers. The flock will be important to you. Timothy was genuinely concerned for the welfare of the saints. Second, he suppressed his own interest for theirs. Look at verse 21. For they all seek after their own interest and not those of Christ Jesus. You, you think about this. If they had medals in Christianity... Timothy would have won the bronze star for meritorious service in a combat zone. He is there serving Paul uh, there in Rome. Listen, there is spiritual warfare going on around Paul. And of course, the they that he's talking about when he says they all seek after, are still those in Rome with Paul. Good people, likely distracted from their busy lives. And the issue here is true care for the Philippians. Doubtless the, the Romans were deficient in their care for others outside their city. Couldn't care less. Didn't give a flip about other believers. Not Timothy. He has put others first. So he put other Christians in Corinth and Ephesus. Very, very pleasant, unpleasant situation. He's has a history of caring for lost people. He was left in Macedonia when Paul went on to Athens when 1 Timothy was written. He was trusted to do the work of an evangelist. He was Paul's right-hand man. You know what was interesting about Timothy? As a young man, he left home to become a missionary. I know indeed Timothy uh, suppressed his own interest in favor of of the gospel. And number three, he's been proven over time. Look at verse 22. But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Not only did Timothy do this on a short-term mission, he did this, he maintained this attitude over years of ministry. He is tested. The word here is a is a word that means tested and proven reliable. It's used of coins. When you take a, a stylus and scratch the face of a coin, and you dig down into the face of the coin, and you find out whether it's silver or just silver plated. You ever reach into a coat pocket and you pulled out the inspector's label? That this, this coat was inspected by number 33 or whoever it was. I often wonder, I wonder if I could actually get in touch with number 33 to talk about this coat that they inspected. Got three sleeves or something like that. How'd you miss that? Timothy has lived a life under inspection and he has passed that inspection. And so Paul says, therefore... I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust the Lord that I myself will be coming shortly. So he values this young man. He knows the Philippians value them. And he says, as soon as we see how things are, we'll cut him loose. You can understand why Paul would want to keep him for a while. 
Now for us today, the application ought to be fairly easy. We want to be effective Christians, right? We, we want to hear the applause of heaven. We would like for those who um, work alongside us to feel about us and our ministry as Paul felt about Timothy. But more than that, I get the feeling that God was pleased with Timothy and we want God to be pleased with us in our ministries, whatever they may be. So three things very quickly. How, would, how are you going to be an effective like Timothy? Well, be genuinely concerned for others. How many times do we say to somebody, how you doing? And then when they start telling us, we're like, I only got like 10 seconds here. Did we really mean that? You know, how you, or was it kind of like the Romans used to greet one another and ask, how are you sweating? It's important in hot cultures. But you didn't want to hear all the details, right? This sort of thing. Listen, be genuinely concerned for others. Listen, emote, care when you hear these things. And then number two, subordinate your interest in favor of others. It's not all about us, is it? And in fact, to be valued as Timothy is valued is to say to that other person, you know what, you are more important than I am. And then three, be in it for the long haul. The Christian journey is not a sprint it's a marathon. And some laps seem longer than others, like being in a quarantine situation with your children. Can I get an amen long distance and over the internet? Some of that's awesome. And then some of it gets kind of old. But that's what family is about. We're to be in it in the long haul, even when it's difficult and even when it's easy. The story is told of a prominent soldier returning from foreign duty and a, a newly hired driver was sent to the station to pick him up by this guy's mom. And he asked her, how would he recognize the soldier, right? Now, how am I going to know who he is? And his mother said this, look for somebody helping someone else. That will be my son. That ought to be us as well. Genuinely concerned for the needs of others. So look, evangelism. It's not a way to grow the local church. And that's subversive, isn't it? We, we think about, what are you talking about? Well, so in many years, we've done it like this. We've gone to somebody's home. We knocked on the door. We share the gospel with them. They receive the gospel. Everything's great. Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we start Sunday school. But what if they say, well, you know what? We, we're so grateful you came here today. But we don't know that God's going to lead us to join your church. We're going to look around and we're offended. What do you mean? We expect you to come to our church so we can spend your resources together. <laughs> no, no, no. Evangelism is not a way to grow the local church. We, we're not here to consume our resources together. We evangelize because there's a person who's in danger. We love that person. Amen. That's how Timothy was. So you ought to be like Timothy. And I ought to be more like Timothy, right? But Paul gives another example. So not only should you be like Tim, you should also be like Epaphroditus. And that's Philippians 2, 25-30. Similar things are said about Epaphroditus as Paul said about Timothy. So first, he had been proven over time. Look at verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is your messenger and minister to my need. Paul refers to him. He, he, he gives several thing, descriptions of him, and these, these aren't just cast-off descriptions. So first of all, he calls him my brother, right? This, this guy is in my family, my faith family, so he's dear to him. And then he calls him a fellow worker. You know what that means? He's not a spectator. He's an active participant in the gospel. And then he calls him a fellow soldier. He doesn't call him a fellow general. Right? He is a worker. An infantryman, if you will. And that's where most of us are. And he's the men he was ministering to Paul's needs. You notice what he's not doing? He's not climbing up the ministerial ladder 
See, you know what that apostle over there in, in, uh, in Ephesus, he doesn't have all this jail stuff going on and he has a bigger church that he's with. I'll just go over and serve that guy. He's not doing that sort of thing at all. And in fact, he's doing something very dangerous. He's been entrusted with a large sum of money and he is traveling by himself in a very dangerous situation in antiquity is to be on the road with some cash. Because not only are you responsible for the cash, there are people who will feel the responsibility to liberate you from that cash. But here's a trusted man. And he's been doing so over a long time. Not only that, he was truly concerned for others. Does that sound familiar? Listen to what it says in verse 26. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Did you catch that? Epaphroditus was distressed that the Philippians had heard that he had gotten sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. So in verse 26, even though he had so quickly come to Rome, he was disturbed. He was disturbed for, because he didn't want the Philippians to be worried. He's disturbed not because he was sick and had grown ill. In fact, near to death. But because the Philippians were worried about him. Number three, he risked his life for the sake of the gospel. Look at verse 28. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. If Timothy had won the bronze star for service, Epaphroditus got the purple heart. One of the saddest things about 9-11 were to hear of the heroes. The firefighters who didn't run from the collapsing building, but ran to the collapsing building. We have something similar going on today where we have nurses and doctors who instead of living in quarantine, purchasing tons and tons of hand sanitizer and learning how to do things from a distance are running toward the problem. And there are people's lives who have been saved because of this. Those firefighters ran into a building soon to fall on their heads to rescue people. These doctors and nurses are running into contaminated hospital rooms to rescue them. I heard on the radio today, when they get a vaccine, who are going to, who's going to get it first? And there's this discussion about who should. And my first thought was, you know, those in high risk, 65 and above, got underlying conditions, that sort of thing. But one person made a, a remark that I thought, oh, that's right. Those health workers ought to get the first vaccines. They've been running to the fight. I want you to know there are believers who have been doing this today that we hardly ever hear about, who are running to the fight. I know, I have former students in the Congo creating a language for people who don't have a written language and they are uh, translating the Bible from the Greek that I've taught them into that language that they created for this people group. Now that is cool as cool gets. I know of another lady who's a missionary in Uganda and her missionary is to the isolated tribes and she does veterinary work. And she, she's gotten to know these people but they're a bit xenophobic. 
And so she has decorated her Land Rover with cow horns and bells and, and hides and all of these weird, it's the weirdest looking vehicle that you would ever see. But she does that so that they know it's her and they would stop shooting at her when she drives up. I've known missionaries who are in tropical situations who are given malaria drugs, but they don't take the malaria drugs because the malaria is less impactful on their lives than the drugs are. And yet there they are. So their choice was not to take the drugs or get malaria. Their choice was not to leave because the situation was hard. I know believers in the Sudan who are fighting through civil war. I know people who are going into Iran to give the gospel and other these hard places. These are our heroes that we hardly ever hear about. And they are running to the battle. But let me, let me tell you this. We are to run to the battle too. So how do you do this? What you have to have is a foundation for such a faith that runs the risk, right? And so how do you do that? Well, you can. God does it in you. And so you tap into what He has already given you. He has given you a sincere love for Christ. You ought to develop that. Read His Word. Pray. Watch for His fingerprints in your life. This last week I've been building a... Uh, one of the things that's happened in my in my quarantine is that we're down a bathroom because my shower floor in the master bath bathroom fell through. And so you want to have real fun, you'd be down a bathroom and do quarantine as well. So we, I have been working to uh, fix the bathroom and I've, I've got Kathy some, uh, I, I bought her a nice tub and we're getting it all put together, that sort of thing. But as I'm working with the wood, I got a massive splinter in the index finger. And those hurt because there are a lot of there are a lot of nerve endings at the end of those those fingertips. And so I pulled out the splinter and left a piece in the finger. Isn't that an awful feeling? You know, this is gonna hurt for weeks. And then about 30 minutes later I smashed that finger just horribly. And the splinter came out. <laughs> And I thought, Lord, you had a reason for mashing my finger. Thank you. You know, literally that was my thought. Pain does things to you, you know. But are we looking for God's hands on the things that we are doing? And even in the small things in, in our lives, this sort of thing. A sincere love for Christ, dwelling in His Word, looking for His interaction in our life. And if you love him, then it shouldn't be hard to have a love for the brethren and the sistren, too. You love what he loves. They don't have to be perfect, do they? If you love him, you love what he loves, even though some people are hard to love, you know, just to be honest with you. But if he loves them, then we ought to be able to love them. And then the third thing, it's time to give up turf protection, self-interest. What is our interest? The things of God, the things of Christ. And are we really willing to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel? To do without so the gospel will be proclaimed. I teach at a seminary. I have to have a PhD to be a seminary professor. Um, I got the PhD because God had called me to be a, a seminary professor. And I'm surrounded and work in a field of, of uh, very smart, very intelligent people. And there are day after day that I feel like that they're gonna learn that I'm not one of them I'm just a Baptist preacher. 
When I got my PhD, my mom, who I talked about last week, she was delightful. She bought a crystal chess set, brought it to me. And I don't play chess. I mean, I know how, but it's not the passion of my life, so I don't need a crystal chess set, nor any chess set, just to be honest with you. Um, and I said, oh, thank you. She said, well, I've given this to you so you can put it in your office and when people come into your office, they'll think you're smart. <laughs> I don't think she meant it the way that I felt that it came out. But it resonated with how I feel about myself at, at times. I, I, I feel like they're all going to find out I'm just a Baptist preacher. And then I get reminded. It would be a step up to be a faithful Baptist preacher and a seminary professor. I think there's far more worth in the kingdom than high profile celebrities out there, but faithful men and women serving Christ, willing to sacrifice. That's Timothy, and that's Epaphroditus. I want to conclude by reminding you of Adoniram Judson. He left in America, in the New England area, to go to Burma. Today it's called Myanmar. As he's traveling overseas, he's reading the Bible, he left as a congregationalist. And he's reading the Bible and he looks up at his wife, Anne, and he says, I've been studying about this baptism thing and the Baptists are right. So he, he lands July 13th, 1813, and the first thing he does is he sends a letter back to the Congregationalist saying, I can't be your missionary because I don't believe in your doctrine anymore. And then he petitions the, the American Baptists in the Triennial Convention to be their missionary. They accept him. And he starts his work. Seven years later, he completed translating four Gospels and the letters from John into a very difficult language. Uh, he had a, a, a tremendous struggle at first. By 1823, this is 10 years later after his arrival, the membership of the little church had grown to 18 members. And Judson had finally finished the first draft of his translation of the entire text of the New Testament in Burmese. And something horrible happened. Burma went to war with Great Britain on June 8, 1824, and the Westerners were rounded up, and Adoniram Judson was rounded up as well. He's in prison. They're using fetters and torture. He was in prison for 17 months during the war. Um... He and a friend were violently arrested. The officers, led by an official executioner, burst into Judson's home, threw Judson on the ground in front of his wife, bound him with torture thongs, and dragged him off to prison. Twelve agonizing months later, Judson and his fellow prisoners were marched overland, barefoot and sick, for six more months of misery in extreme conditions. His wife, Anne, She's emaciated and sick. She followed him there. They, she had had a little girl and no longer able to nurse. Uh, she had arranged for to bribe the guards to let Judson out of prison long enough each day to care for his wife and child. And he'd go through the streets of that city with that emaciated baby in his arms looking for somebody to nurse the child because Anne no longer could every evening. The sufferings and brutalities of those 20 long months and days in prison, half starved, fettered in iron, sometimes trussed and suspended by mangled feet with only head and shoulders touching the ground. When peace talks came up, they needed an English translator, so they came and got Judson. But on October 24th, 1826, Anne, who had been sick for a long time, died. She died at Amherst in Burma, a victim of the long, dreadful months of disease, death, stress, and loneliness that had been hers for 21 months. Her child died six months later. 
Judson is finally let out of prison. It's a paralyzing, year-long siege of depression hit him. And my question was, what took you so long? It's no wonder that he had depression. It, it overcame him after the death of his wife and his child. He got news that his father died and he, he went into the jungle and lives in a shack. Outside the shack, he dug his own grave and day after day he sits and looks into the grave. God, I know you're there, but I can't feel you. Is what he says. And what's happening there is, is God is purging him. Purging him of all his honors. He gets worried that he came to Burma for his own glory and not God's. Then he gets a letter. His younger brother had died. And you would think, oh, it's just piling up on him. But this letter was different. His brother hadn't been a believer while he was gone. And he got the news that his brother had died. But he died in faith. He had come to Christ. This renewed Judson's hope and life. And here's what John Piper said about, about Judson in these long periods of depression. He learned to spurn the world without falling into bitterness and darkness. By God's grace, he shook off and set out alone on long canoe trips up the Salween River into tiger-infested jungles to evangelize a tribe known as the Karen. On April 10th, 1834, he became known as the Apostle to the Karen. Within a few years, um, of the end of the war with Britain, Baptist membership doubled on an average of every eight years for 32 years between 1834 and 1866. Judson very famously married two more times and had eight children. Eventually, he developed a serious lung disease and doctors prescribed a sea voyage as a cure. On April 12, 1850, though, he died at the age of 61 on board a ship in the Bay of Bengal. He was buried at sea. He spent 37 years of missionary service abroad with only one trip back home to America that whole time. When Judson began his mission to Burma, he set a goal of translating the Bible and founding a church of a hundred members before his death. By the time of his death, he had accomplished those goals and more. He leaves behind a translation of the New Testament. He leaves behind a dictionary of Burmese into English that is still being used today. And in fact, I talked to a missionary this week that said that, that that dictionary actually has a genetic relationship to modern dictionaries. But, he, but not only that, he, he leaves behind a New Testament that today is the favorite in Myanmar. 8,000 believers came to Christ during his time there in large part due to his influence. Today, Myanmar has a large number of Baptists. They number almost a million and are half the Protestants in all of the country. And each July, Baptist churches in Myanmar celebrate Judson Day, commemorating his arrival as a missionary. What do we say about Adoniram Judson? He had a sincere love for Christ. When he came back to America, they wanted to hear all the missionary stories. Tell us something interesting, they said. And he said, there's nothing more interesting than Christ and his gospel. What's wrong with you people? He had a sincere love for Christ. He had a sincere love for the brethren. You don't go to the jungles of Myanmar if you don't care for those people. 
And dare we say that he had a willingness to sacrifice for others for the sake of the gospel. Buried three wives. Underwent enormous to torture. Left family and friends. He didn't have Skype and Facebook and Zoom to talk back. When he was gone, he was gone and never really even had a furlough that we're so used to. So today, as we think about this text, let's be like Timothy. Let's be like Epaphroditus. But both of those men were like Christ. And that's our goal. So today, as we think about how do we respond to this, let us repent from false expectations about ministry. I've had people tell me all the time, you Baptist preachers are wealthy, and I, my wife laughs at them. Or maybe that the, the idea is that we get patted on the back all the time. You're doing such a great job. When, it, when the truth is that we do enter into spiritual warfare in the, and there is psychological warfare that happens. Remember that we serve Christ. We serve Him faithfully. No matter what the response is. Let us repent from only giving the religious wheel a spin. It's Sunday. We're going to church. Or lately, it's we're going to gather and watch the video. Just because it's what we do. We give the religious wheel a spin. Let's repent from that. And worship Him in the beauty of holiness. Let's repent from serving and self-serving attitudes. Oh, I remember my days of trying to get people to serve on all the committees in the church. You ever, ever been on the nominating committee? That's a joy. And it's a, it's only becomes less of a joy when you get about a third of the way through it. And now you're looking for uh, service positions. And the great delight is when somebody says, I was hoping you'd ask me to do that. Let's repent from neglecting the poorest and the weakest among us. And let's commit. Let's commit to making Christ our King. For some of us, that's for the first time. To give our life to Christ. To turn from our sin and make Him the Lord of our life. For others of us, it's to remind us that Jesus is our King. We do what He asked us to do. And sometimes He asks us to make a difficult journey. Let us commit to serving without thought of applause or reward. One of the things I've railed against in Baptist churches are all the plaques. This pew, I'm looking right now so I don't get myself in trouble, but this pew given in memory of, you know, as we raise money and all of that sort of thing. I served in a church that had so many plaques, I thought about the structural integrity of the walls were about to come down. They were all over everywhere. You know what happens though, plaques? They burn up with fervent heat. And if we're doing something to get a plaque or a little bronze placard, we have our reward. Let's stop that. It's okay to say thank you with a plaque or something like that. I railed against on this in a, a church that I served in 2006, 2010. And when I resigned, they gave me a plaque. <laughs> I deeply appreciate it. But I thought, y'all didn't hear that, did you? Love those people. Love the guy they put that in on his heart. But I at least missed one thing I said. Let's commit to making Christ our King. Let's commit to serving without thought of applause or reward. And let us commit to prioritizing the kingdom in every area of life. Because the applause you want to hear is well done, you good and faithful servant. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, tough things to hear. And we ask you, God, that you'd give us the ability to do so. We pray, God, for everyone hearing our message today that they would respond yes to Jesus. Lord, we pray these things and in this service in His name.
Amen.